Hello and welcome to um, the Building a Bright Future webinar. Um, this is a recording of the webinar that happened uh, on Wednesday the 12th of August in the evening, uh, presented by Tracy Pate and myself. I'm Lindy Bringman. I'm a consultant here at the Community Resource Unit in the Families for Inclusive Education project. Um, I'm a mother myself of four children, uh, one daughter who has a disability and she is in year 10 at the moment and this subject is very relevant to us. Uh, we're currently going through our set planning and um, looking at all of that um, preparation for years 11 and 12. Um, Tracy Pate uh, joined me for this online workshop for parents and she has a wealth of information as you'll soon see. She uh, is mother to Bobby who graduated from uh, school last year, from year 12. And um, as you'll hear, um, it took some advocacy on her part um, and um, some intention. Uh, and he's had a, um, a great year 13 so far this year, um, even though uh, it has been a little interrupted by COVID-19 as everyone's lives have been. Uh, so I'm going to start screen sharing now. Um, this is just a little introduction um, before we go into the recording uh, of uh, last week's online workshop. Who is CREW? Um, CREW has uh, existed for over 30 years and uh, very much in line with this online workshop. Uh, it has existed to challenge ideas and practices which limit the lives of people with disabilities. And certainly history has shown that um, often as, as young people with disabilities start entering senior studies and planning for the years ahead into adulthood, sometimes the expectations can be quite low and um, they and their parents can find um, the expectations are not great um, for the future. And so that's why this workshop um, was developed. To begin with, um, and these are acronyms that if you're heading towards, if you're in year 10 or heading towards um, year 10, uh, these acronyms will be things that are explained and you'll see repeatedly come up in Queensland in your processes with school. So very quickly, um, those are the acronyms there. I won't go through them, um, but uh, this, these are, uh, things we refer to in this presentation. So a question that we started with in uh, the workshop was what are the pathways after school and um, how these differed for school graduates with disability and uh, what the participants on the evening um, typed in were things like the, the typical pathways were things like university, TAFE, um, a gap year was one that somebody suggested. Um, that might be more difficult um, these days, uh, but um, certainly very typical and relevant. And um, uh, often it's about, you know, getting a job, employment, or doing further education and training. How this differs for school graduates with disability. Um, some people suggested supported employment options, um, sheltered workshop type scenarios. Um, maybe even sort of shuffling towards a pension or volunteer work rather than paid work. Um, life skills type groups and options rather than um, something that would be considered the typical ordinary path. And so this is very much why we um, feel that this is a topic that needs to be discussed. Um, so the parents can be very clear in how they can move forward and support their teenager with disability to pursue their dreams. This workshop and all of our work in the Families for Inclusive Education um, project is framed very much um, within uh, the right as um, in Australia, which is under the Disability Discrimination Act and the Disability Standards for Education. Uh, that it's unlawful to discriminate and all children with disability have a right to be provided reasonable adjustments to access and participate education from um, pre-schooling right up to um, tertiary education. So that well and truly means that reasonable adjustments 
um, are accessible by all students um, for senior planning and that these adjustments should be in place um, in consultation with the student um, and their advocates, their parents or guardians. And we also um, present this workshop with reference to the inclusive education policy. So this um, online workshop has been funded by the Department of Education and their new inclusive education policy um, states that one of the indicators of success of the policy is increasing the proportion of students with disability receiving a QCE, which is a Queensland Certificate of Education. Um, now I will play the recording um, from last week and you will hear how Tracy supported her son Bobby to achieve a Queensland Certificate of Education last year and, um, and why that was important to them. And I hope that you can take away some of those um, tips and information and, um, and, and support your child to do the same thing and pursue their dreams. And I will leave you with um, Tracy beginning her story of supporting Bobby through her, his senior year of schooling. Um, and she starts with a beautiful photo of Bobby on his graduation day, uh, leading his um, cohort, the rest of the year 12s, through the, um, the um, graduation tunnel. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful photo and she begins um, from there, which is a good spot to start. Thank you, bye. Participation in co-curricular activities and um, social activities in the school and all the year 12 um, rituals. And how, um, how we got there. Um, so sharing of, you know, his vision and dreams, sorry, that's went through, um, for the good life. And we did that often with the school, that we um, wanted him really to have the same opportunities as his siblings. Um, so we talked about um, Bobby going on and continuing maybe to do tertiary studies after school, whether it be a diploma or another certificate. Um, we talked about all his attributes that he had and we always, spoke of him in a very positive light. We talked about getting a real job with a real wage, um, maybe traveling, you know, where he'll end up living. And we'd write those dreams down. And I think if you share them with other people and you write them down, it's more likely for those things to happen in your child's life. Um, we always thought about what his what his passions were as well and his interests. Um, so let's have a look at what his year 12 um, was for him. I think also in the last um, couple of months, people who have children seen in year 12 now and Bobby's younger brother is in year 12, these things have become really important. You know, you hear the schools, all they want to do is make sure that the year 12s have a formal, that they can get back and play sport, that they get a valedictory dinner, that they go on their retreat thinking about their school years. And Bobby did have the opportunity of doing all those things. And I think for um, myself who finished school, you know, 40 years ago, you do actually remember those things probably more than what you actually studied. So it's really important not to just focus on the academic side of your child's life, but also that they have some great memories from their last couple of years of school um, because they're pretty fun times. Um, so he, you know, did sport all the way through school. Um, and I think that one of the things that probably I found helpful to help with the social connections was actually for him to be included academically in the classrooms as well. And it made it a lot easier for him to connect with his peers and for him to automatically to be included in um, things that are outside the classroom. But you've always got that balancing act of the academic and the social. And um, 
it um, is worth doing it, um, of pursuing both, I believe. Um, so he, in the last couple of years of his schooling, he uh, did do quite a bit of volunteering and also work experience, which probably we were pushed into the work experience from the fact that he was studying some certificate courses, um, his certificate to in hospitality, which is um, something that he really enjoyed. He's very social. He loves um, connecting with people and um, being hospitable. So the hospitality certificate really suited him. And part of that was that he needed to do so many hours in cafes or serving people. And some of that he would help at the school at functions, as did the other hospitality students. But also that um, we arranged for him to go to a cafe and also get work experience there. And I think one of the things that can help with work experience, because you also want that to be a really good experience for your child, is that we use some NDIS funds to um, employ somebody to support him in the role that he was um, participating in at the cafe. And this gave us um, some great opportunities to realise what his skills were, to, think, to find the things that he really loved doing. And he also, um, you know, it helps the business too that uh, they're doing the work experience with. So that was, it's a great opportunity during school to start um, going down that pathway. And it also gets um, your child ready for the idea of working. So um, I am pretty proud of the fact that Bobby did receive a QCE um, certificate at the end of year 12. Um, it was probably something that the school never thought um, was possible. Um, Bobby was the only um, person, that, a, a student that they were, that was going to be doing QCIA and um, all the way through year 10, that was the school's idea that he'd get a QCIA. Um, but I um, persevered with the idea of getting a QCE. It's um, probably not something that Bobby knows too much about himself other than the fact that he was doing great work at school and really being included you know, in great subjects. And um, the certificate itself probably doesn't mean anything to him, but it means quite, quite a bit to me. <laughs> um, so we, um, I had to work pretty hard to find out how this was going to happen. And as uh, Lindy mentioned, you need 20 points that can be accumulated post school. Um, so that's always something that you can keep in the back of your mind um, that you know, you, you can do some maths and literacy post-school if the school is saying that, that, you know, they won't be able to get the points through that way. Um, so he ended up um, studying the general maths, English communication, visual art in practice, religion, the hospitality to certificate at school. And then he did a Cert three design fundamentals and graphics. And that was through TAFE at schools, which I hadn't heard of up until um, he was going into grade 11. But it also is, um, I wasn't that keen on him going to TAFE and missing a day of school and being separated from his cohort. But actually quite a few of the students were going to do TAFE and, um, so I looked into what was available and there was a subject um, that I, th I thought would he would really enjoy. It was at South Bank. So that also was attractive that there's some great eating places around there. He does like to eat out. Um, so we, he, he decided on these, on these subjects and um, we, um, what I love about it is that really in year 12, he had the opportunity to study some brilliant topics, um, things that are so important to learn about. You know, he learned about refugees, poverty, 
um, how males and females are portrayed in advertising. Um, he had the opportunity to do lots of presentation and to do lots of group work. And these are all things that he loved doing. Um, and he, um, he also, this is a photo of him at one of his jobs now, which is in a place called the Print Bar that does T-shirt printing. And at his work, he's doing um, dispatch in the dispatch area at the moment. But there's some very creative people there. And I love the fact, potentially, this job might move on to something that will um, include some of the skills that he learnt at TAFE. Um, so in deciding these subjects, we really looked at his strengths, his interests, but I also was um, thinking about the teachers potentially that he would have. Um, Bobby does love sport, but I realised the certificate in recreation, probably it wasn't a good mix with who would be running that course. Um, so I think that you've got to be fairly strategic in trying to ascertain a QCE. And um, we, um, you know, really looked at his passions, his interests, and lots of things. The certificate three also gave him eight points, which was pretty exciting, and that wasn't done through school. So um, I think that you have to look at your child's, um, what they want, but also assist them in seeing about how they can get the points. But do remember, you can acquire some of the points after school and things like maths and literacy, you can do short courses um, and get points that way. There's actually lots of ways you can get points. You know, if you do drama outside school, um, Duke of Edinburgh. So there's lots of different ways, which is something that you need to look at. Um, so in advocating and achieving for the QCE, um, the, our vision, you know, we wanted a quality education. We wanted them to be fully included in regular classes, to be taught by teachers and to be fully participating in school life. And I just found it hard to see how that vision of ours was going to reconcile with doing a QCIA and how the teachers would be able to accommodate him doing a QCIA and him being in the classroom doing the same type of curriculum as the other students. Um, so I think the vision that we have is really a great compass for us. When we come to these times in his life of making quite big decisions. Um, so we really investigated the different pathways um, and what was offered with the QCIA and how he could ascertain um, the QCE. The other thing was um, we really, I tried to keep a positive relationship with the school, even though we were told at the end of year 10 that no teacher in the school believed that he could um, get the QCE. And I think that sometimes schools and teachers and may not be aware of the accommodations that are available for students um, with getting with the QCAA. So um, that is something that you really need to look at. And I studied long and hard and spoke about and looked through every subject and the accommodations are quite um, broad and it may not be, you know, you may have two students with Down syndrome and the accommodations could be quite different. So every student is different and it, there's um, a fairly big list of the type of accommodations, but they're just examples. So it's up to the school to actually decide the accommodations um, and they have to look at what the accommodations were. And I think that you can have a look at what some sort of accommodation your child is getting in grade 10. And those accommodations can often be carried through to the senior years. Um, once um, you got, I got some teachers on board, that 
positive mindset actually started to spread to other teachers and they shared their knowledge between each other of what the ways that they could scaffold different um, subjects, ways that they could do assessment. Um, and I also shared any knowledge that I had gained, any professional development opportunities. Um, so it was a, I worked pretty hard in year 11, um, talking a lot to the teachers about different accommodations that I thought would be beneficial for him. But by year 12, I actually um, didn't have to do it anymore. So the teachers, you know, had gained a greater understanding themselves and they worked themselves um, towards the goal of getting a QCE. Um, I think another thing that I learnt probably in secondary school, that it's a really good idea to keep a record of all your correspondence, communication, emails, telephone calls, meetings, because um, probably nobody else is going to keep as good a record as you. And it's a really good way of keeping everybody on the same path and being able to bring everybody um, together so that they're on the same page. Um, so the practical aspects of um, planning for and achieving the QCE is, um, you know, balancing between not really overstressing your child. He definitely at times would be, as most children are going into exams or having to do a presentation, um, say that he was very nervous about it. And you just, um, I'd reassure him that, that's a good feeling. Most people feel the same way when they're doing things. Um, but you need to, um, you know, keep the vision for that ordinary life that you are wanting for your child at the end of, at the end of school. Um, looked at the subjects he's interested in and how inclusive the teacher would be or the approach of the teacher. Um, and I, as I said, TAFE was probably not something that um, I was very keen on at the beginning, but it probably ended up being one of the things that he really loved, that it gave him a feeling of what school was going to be like after, you know, what it was going to be like post-school and, you know, the independence you have, um, the skills that you, you know, learn out of school as well. Um, the reasonable adjustments, um, probably a lot of schools are really unsure of what those adjustments are. And they may say things like, oh, I can actually have an extra five minutes in every half hour for an exam, which would be absolutely totally useless to somebody like Bobby. Um, that is just something that can be plucked out of the adjustments, but it's actually not what a reasonable adjustment for a, a student like Bobby is. Um, and yeah, keep your options open after school graduation for what, um, you know, for the opportunities. As I said, he may, you know, want to go on and do some further study. He's actually just done a TAFE Online Certificate two course recently in customer service. So I really love the idea of continuing to get, um, you know, to being educated. I think it's such a wonderful opportunity for everybody to get a quality education. And I will talk a bit later on about what his life is like now, um, which is pretty good. <laughs> so um, we did want to highlight um, the reasonable adjustments that are possible. Um, now I've taken this little snippet from a fact sheet that's actually available and downloadable from that link there on the QCAA website. And I will send that link through to you in the follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, but I've just taken this little snip of um, example adjustments that can be made for a student with intellectual disability or neurological impairment. And you can see um, that there's quite a few things there. So um, there's assistance, um, extra time, rest breaks, a reader, um, you can get computer or assistive technology um, and you can even get 
extra time um, and um, and that and like what Tracy's saying is think you know sort of outside the box don't you know you can actually apply it doesn't for... necessarily have to be you know an exam an exam it could be you know that it's shown over a matter of weeks um the what he what he's learned his knowledge and what was interesting a lot of the adjustments that they were using for him they actually started using for other students as well um so it um were things that they said oh this is Great, you know, this will be so good for some of the other students that they probably hadn't thought about um, how these adjustments could be used. So, uh, yeah, I think that um, it's really to have the support there so your child can show their knowledge and what they've learned. Yeah. So um, now we're going to uh, put you into breakout rooms um, in just a moment. So we're going to get you to have a think about, um, I'll just click on the next thing, <laughs> um, what, what you would like to, what, what, what you think your child might like to do. So I think um, something to take away is don't just think what is easy or what do I think my child could get into. Instead, try and think what does my child love to do? Because that's, that's what you would normally think about any child um, in grade 10. And just because um, a child has a disability does not mean that um, these questions are irrelevant. And in fact, I think we just need to refocus and reframe even more on what our child loves to do, what their interests are, and what are their strengths, and then actually start helping them to pursue their vision. So um, there was a sheet that was attached to the email that came out on Monday that looks like this. So if you have it, um, you can pull it out. Otherwise, um, if you've got that email handy, um, you might be able to open it up and at least sort of just work through those questions. Um, so we're going to move on to the planning activity now um, and, and so start really thinking about what your particular child's interests and strengths are and, um, and, and then sort of um, work through the questions on that sheet. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, so I'm going to break you into rooms of about um, three or four people. And I'm going to ask, as soon as you get in there, could you find someone in your um, group who wouldn't mind being a timekeeper for your group? So um, to have a, put a timer on the phone or, or just watch the clock um, for five minutes and give yourselves five minutes to actually fill in those sheets. And after five minutes, um, can your timekeeper call time? And then each of you actually share some thoughts um, with each other um, for another few minutes. And then when you come back, we would just like someone to speak from each of those groups. So do have a bit of an idea who might like to just, um, not necessarily to share anything personal about, you know, the children um, in your lives, but more sort of what you found about the process and, and, um, and benefits of it or, or any other thoughts or ideas that you came up with as a group. Okay, so um, give me a moment and we should have you off um, very soon. We'll move on. Thank you everybody for working um, in that together. Um, just to look at some blocks and barriers that are probably important to be aware of. Um, so obviously school systems and um, QCAA processes to ask for the reasonable adjustments can be tricky. So um, I will send, an, uh, in my email, I'll send a link where you can access all the information on reasonable adjustments. And you will see on there that there's a process. Um, it's important to know, and you'll see in there, probably in between the lines, because um, there is a bit of reading, um, but you'll see that actually all the processes that you've got happening already. So if your child is receiving adjustments right now um, as part of the EAP process or the NCCD, which is the Nationally Consistent Collection of Data, 
um, if, if you know whatever supports and adjustments are being put in place at the moment is exactly the stuff that the school can apply for and they don't need to apply until actually for um, what they call unit three and unit four which is the year 12 part of the senior studies uh, the adjustments that they have in place going into year 11 um, should align with what they are anticipating to apply for um, but the actual application is it's a bit of a process there will be um, and there's paperwork and that sort of thing as there often is. <laughs> I think um, you know with the new ATAR system probably some ATAR subjects the ones for ATAR where they've got the external assessment um, it can be a little bit more challenging to get um, some accommodations because I think it's set as an external exam but you can still do a lot of subjects at school that um, are not in the ATAR system yep. and um, my understanding is there's lots of ways to go to university mm. that it's not necessarily to do it uh, with the ATAR as yeah. um, a pathway to university. Yeah, and, ma and many children are very successful um, getting certificates and getting into university in other ways rather than trying to go through the ATAR system, which is um, very heavily based in external and large assessments um, and that sort of thing. Um, old ideas and low expectations of what's possible. And these ideas might come from um, anyone that you're having to have a conversation with. So it could be school staff, it could be um, disability employment services. Some services are further along than others as far as an understanding of um, what it is to actually get social justice and, um, and pursue the rights of of young people with disability and, their, and, and accessing open employment and that sort of thing. So you might find some services are, are further along than others. Um, and the ATAR system is new. So it only just came in um, this year. So this is the first year, isn't it, yeah. of ATAR? So um, everyone is still really getting their head around it. Um, and I, look, I don't have a full understanding, but I do get the impression that basically so sort of this new standardised um, everyone needs to pass and to get their 20 points and um, need to pass a literacy and numeracy um, section to get um, their um, QCE. QCE has sort of also changed as well as part of that. Um, and, you know, with the added systems of the QCAA now having more um, overall authority of the actual assessment processes even in applied subjects um, it's sort of everyone's sort of still getting their heads around it and certainly my, the conversations I was having on Monday um, with my daughter's school was very much like I, I came in with all my information um, and you could sort of tell that I, I probably have spent way more time looking at the adjustments that are possible and 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 trying to sort of make the system work than they probably have um, so it's it's going to be about understanding that you know there's going to be a negotiation process. Um, so we're going to put you into breakout rooms one more time, and the aim of this is for all of you to at least go away with one idea um, of your next step. So what do you think you need to? And, so, and sometimes it's about thinking what do you need to find out about so it might be about adjustments it might be um, more about the ATAR um, it might be about finding out what sorts of jobs are out there because I think um, you know jobs are changing rapidly um, just even since you know when we left school um, and, and what are they in say? the last six months that's right <laughs> the last six months you know uh, um, and they say like most jobs it for the, in the next 10 years and uh, haven't even been created yet. So it's, it's that sort of, you know, what do you need to find out about to be able to support your child the best? Um, if you don't, if you're stuck, now the stuck as in terms of don't really know what your child could possibly do, but I get the, I get the idea that this group is actually um, pretty um, knowledgeable of their children. Sometimes though, um, some parents can think, oh, what, what is my child good at? Like, you know, what are they interested in? And they might only be able to come up with a couple of small things. 
And that's when sometimes it's helpful to have a group of people around you because they have different experiences. So for example, if your child is good at, um, they just love games, which is probably, you know, <laughs> common on technology, um, then having 10 different perspectives, or so a few different ideas for 10, a few different perspectives to give 10 different ideas of jobs um, or further training or um, opportunities in the community that would be centered around those sorts of ideas. So it could be, you know, graphic design or do a photography course or, um, you know, get a job at the local JB, not JB Hi-Fi or um, EB Games or, you know, so um, uh, having more people rather than just relying on your own ideas um, can be really empowering and, and strengthening. So we're going to break you back into those rooms again, um, um, just for a few minutes this time, and then um, we'll come back and we'll finish off. There we go. Okay, so this is Bobby's year 13. There it is. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, so this is um, him in his two jobs um, that he got when he finished school and he, um, with COVID, he, both jobs went um, and of course he was the one um, in the blue uniform, he's at Centenary Pool. So he loves swimming um, and he works at Centenary Pool. He also loves making coffee, serving people, meet and greet. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> when COVID um, closed down the pools, he couldn't go to the pool. And then the other job, um, their business just stopped overnight. So um, I also was worried about him actually being out in the community with a lot of people. This was back in March. So with both jobs, I said that he would um, step down and... So it worked um, sort of well at the time and we, he then um, took up some of the interests. He did cycling. He became a very good cyclist. Um, we got a personal trainer who came to home. He um, would do lots of other things and the, then the pool opened up and I could see how desperate he was to get back to work, I mean, it just is so important for him. As he says, back on the grind, um, <laughs> when he wasn't working, I'm poor, I don't have money. Um, so, you know, all the things that they talk about at school of, of life skills, um, he actually was taught none of those skills at school, but he is so incredibly independent and it's because he, mm -hmm like wants to get to work, he wants to um, go swimming, he wants to go to the gym and through tape at schools I employed somebody to a support worker to um, use again the NDIS funds to um, let him start catching public transport. So at that stage um, he'd catch the train over to South Bank and now he can independently get travel anywhere around Brisbane, um, whether it be the bus, the train or the city cat. Um, earning money, really loves earning money. And he saw me starting to use my phone. I'd have to say phones are such a great, mm. a great thing for, um, for him. It just gives him so much independence and he can get around his phone like so many apps that I've got no idea of that he just gives him the ability to give him that independence. So he, you know, saw that I was using the wallet for paying for things and people didn't want cash. So, you know, his phone was an older phone. I want to get, I want to get my money on my phone. So he used some of the money from his work to buy a new phone. Now he's got his, the wallet and it's actually pretty good because I can track him through where mm. he's been. <laughs> um, so he did say the other day, um, would you stop, he wrote me a note, would you stop following my food account? <laughs> <laughs> um, but a great problem solver. You know, one of the things during 
COVID was that his siblings had organised at different times to go camping with some friends. We've got a block of land and um, he said, I want to go camping, I want to go camping. So he'd do things like, you know, take photos of what they had taken camping, you know, to arrange for his trip. Um, I think that he, people with an intellectual impairment are so used to watching what other people are doing and so focused. Um, they just take in so much more than anybody else. And um, he really is incredible problem solver himself, um, motivated himself. So, you know, this morning he went cycling at 5.30, put on an alarm, got up, it was dark, you know, got his bike ready last night, put the light on it, um, you know, rode 30 Ks and that's because he really wanted to do it. Um, so if you find what they love, you know, they actually can achieve anything. Um, he's con continuing to develop his own interests and friendships. And, um, you know, it's been a pretty tough time in the last six months, but he started back at the print bar this week. And, you know, you can just see the lift that he has got from that, um, you know, that he's back at both jobs. He's got so much more probably than going on now because we kept him busy during that downtime. He's now got to fit everything else around in with his jobs um, but he's you know meeting great people at work as well and um, it's just you know great to see him continuing to you know be the person that he wants to be and to have that confidence and you know I always feel like you know he's capable of getting around it was I think yesterday he'd gone to somewhere in James Street after swimming to get something to eat before work and you know you have to sign in when you eat at places now and he said oh you know I was having a problem but oh somebody came up you know that tall woman that we see at Tennyson she helped me out it's like you know he just is um it's, it's great to see him just being you know living the life really he's just mm -hmm. got such a full great life so dream big for them um they'll achieve it and you know they really should be given they're given the opportunity they'll reach reach their potentials and he's still growing his wings and um you know his own dreams which is great mm. so in, enjoy the years ahead and um it is nice to finish as well i will, <laughs> say, I will say that <laughs> <laughs> to be at the end <laughs> so in summary um do try to aim high rather than let those conversations and decisions rest on what's easiest um, if you're thinking my child doesn't know what they want to do, well, you know, that's just normal. Most don't. So help them to find what they like. Um, always keep year 13 in your child's sights. Um, some schools don't have a great deal of offerings. So look outside school as well. Um, you, you know, work experience, other opportunities. Think about the people you know in the community that you could, you know, work with, like your friends or acquaintances that you might be able to get some work experience with your for your child. Connections are really connections. good. I mean, basically both of his jobs have come through connections in some way. So, and, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Really. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. Work experience is great. Yeah. Um, try not to limit future opportunities. And we spoke a bit about that, didn't we? Um, so everyone constantly continues to grow and learn. Don't assume that your child is not going to continue to, to develop. And um, at the moment, that's very conscious in my mind um, because, you know, Millie may not get her 20 points, but um, by the end of year 12, uh, but she's still got another five years after this. And so if that's important to her, then, um, then we don't want to be just going down a QCIA <laughs> pathway um, and uh, preventing her from even starting on the QCE. Um, make sure you explore and investigate your choices and options. Don't just let the school organise everything. Um, when it comes to QCIA too, that's really important. So if, you're, if your school is really, really um, stuck on the idea of a QCIA pathway, um, there is uh, available a, a handbook um, which lists all of the goals in there and um, and I would strongly encourage that any parents sort of really try and work it 
Um, it's amazing though, when you actually suggest certificates and things, um, Tracy and I were actually talking about this before, they seem to be less concerned about that, almost like they know that it's not their problem if it's a certificate. So Definitely. The <laughs> so TAFE, at, TAFE at schools are very happy about that. And it was great because it was eight points and, you know, mm. I think, um, yeah, it's, yep. the certificates, I mean, so many, so many students use certificates now as a way of getting to university or, um, mm. you know, getting apprenticeships or getting into the workforce. Mm. So the certificates are a really um, great way of, and they're yeah. much more practical. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a proper qualification. Um, and I, I think that um, any parent should always really, really um, push against having their child only get a QCIA and having earned no points towards a QCE whatsoever. Um, I think it's really like the, there are there are um, rules around that and you can do a maximum of three um, subjects as they are with adjustments towards a QCE before you rule out a QCIA. Um, and, you know, I, I would definitely want to be doing both rather than just the one, um, which is just, yeah, collecting no points at all. Um, and yeah, there are experiences unique to this time in life. You can only be in year 11 and 12 once. So um, even if your child is struggling with literacy and numeracy and those sorts of things, those are lifelong things that can be learned. The only, you can only experience senior studies now. So really um, keep those non-academic aspects of senior school life at the core as well. Remember that social life is really important. Um, setting up friendships, um, and connections for, you know, the, the wonders of the teenage years and beyond. Um, and, and connect with other parents um, for ideas as well. Engage with what's possible, um, who can help you um, in your school as well as in your community. So lastly, we have um, a really enormous range of resources um, on our website. Um, I will flick you through in just a second to show you what's there, but we have individual consultations available. Um, email our um, admin or give us a ring. Um, and um, there is also uh, another section of crew is just literally launching an economic participation project. And this is the information here. Um, it is being done with Family Advocacy in New South Wales and Imagine More, which is based in Canberra. Um, and they're looking at this project, which will support young people with disability to engage with employment. And you can see there they've got um, Imagining Work, which is for years seven and eight, um, Discovering Work for years nine and 10, and Finding Work for years 11 and 12. So watch this space. If you are on the crew mailing list, like the general crew mailing list. Um, so you'll be on our project mailing list um, because you've registered for this workshop. But if you are interested in that, um, do make sure you're on the general crew mailing list and, um, and you'll be able to see the information about that as it comes through. Um, I'm going to do a new share because I just want to quickly show you um, things you might like to look at on our website. Um, so can you see that? Yes. So um, I'll move that out of the way. So you can see um, if you go to our website, here's the crew website under resources, you'll see inclusive education right there. Um, we have all of these tabs. I would highly recommend if you haven't been to any of our workshops or even if you just want to review things. Um, this is a great little video that was done over this COVID period by Jen Moritz, one of the consultants here. And it's just this lovely snapshot of a vision, of using your vision for inclusive education. Um, you can also find out more about inclusive education here under this tab, um, if you're not quite sure how it looks or, or what it means. Um, and there's just a wealth of information um, friendships and belonging actually contains um, 
this brand new resource that we've just created, which is finding roles that help students participate and contribute. And it's very much a working document for schools and for parents to really build belonging um, and find things that your child can really be involved in in school. Um, and barriers, rights and advocacy is another really um, good section. Um, there's, now I have to little think, I think it might be in here. In classroom learning, I think we might even have um, some sort of um, end of, there we go. So here we go, right down the bottom of that section, you'll see also there's um, some fact sheets on getting your first job. Um, and, and, you know, for, for families, if they're concerned about um, their children getting jobs, these are stories about um, the children who, you know, you could be reasonably concerned that they might not, uh, because typically um, these would be the children who would be going into supported employment, for example, or working at Horizons, you know, those sorts of ideas. So um, these are some really lovely stories of um, young people who've gone on to get some really great um, jobs. And there's also this great new resource um, called Lifelong Learners, which is about um, people uh, with disabilities going on beyond school and um, and doing all sorts of wonderful things. So just wanted to bring your attention to those resources. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Tracy, thank you. for sharing yours and Bobby's story. And, um, and I hope that you've all um, gotten something valuable out of this. Um, do keep in touch. And, um, and we'll be here for another five minutes or so. If you want to stay on and ask us some questions um, verbally, feel free. Otherwise, good night. Bye. Bye.